Welcome, everybody. Um, I think we're going to make a start. So my name is Paul Elliott. Um, I'm Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health Medicine here at Imperial College. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth Geoffrey Rose Memorial Distinguished Guest Lecture. And today we're um, very privileged to have Dr. Jonathan Samet talk to us on advancing the population health, moving from measuring risk to action. I'm just going to give a couple of introductory slides and a short, brief introduction to Dr. Summit, and then we'll hand over to him. So this is the sixth in a series of distinguished lectures um, in honor of uh, Jeffrey Rose, and I'll tell you a little bit about him for those who don't know him. So we started in 2011 with the late Jeremiah Stamler, Michael Marmot in 2013, Richard Pito in 2015, Bert Hoffman in 2017, and George Davy Smith in 2019. So you can see it is a very distinguished group of people. Jeffrey Rose um, was uh, a physician at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School um, here, and as you know, that's now part of Imperial College London, which is why we're... Um, owning his name and his lecture. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he was here until he retired in 1991 um, and was a physician and professor of clinical epidemiology. But as many of you know, he was also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and was a very distinguished uh, leader of epidemiology there until he retired again in 1991. And particularly for the younger people and the students in the audience, um, he, uh, he, he did many important things, but he's perhaps best known for uh, his concept of the, <coughs> the idea that it's not just individuals who can get sick, but whole populations can be, get sick. And, and at the top here, you can see uh, the blood pressure distribution of uh, rural Kenyans on, uh, in the blue and the blood pressure distribution of Whitehall civil servants in the yellow. And you can see there's a whole shift in the distribution so that um, <clears throat> in terms of blood pressure-related outcomes, the, uh, the Western societies with higher blood pressure shifted to the right are at greater risk. And uh, at the bottom there, that's looking at cholesterol levels and, um, and risk of coronary heart disease. And while the greatest risk with the dotted line is in the people with the highest cholesterols. And these are actually very high, because this is from Framingham data in, in the, probably the 60s. And actually, there's been a whole shift downwards in the cholesterol distribution in, in the US. But taking that aside, the highest risk is at the higher cholesterol levels. But they don't produce the highest number of cases. That actually happens at, uh, in the main part of the distribution. And he wrote this all up in his uh, really excellent book on preventive medicine, and again, for the students who don't know about this or haven't read it, I would highly recommend that you do that. So our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. John Samet. Uh, he is a pulmonary physician and epidemiologist. He is dean of the Colorado School of Public Health, formerly chair of the Department of Epidemiology at John Hopkins, and then the Floral L. Thornton Chair at the University of Southern California, and director of the USC Institute for Global Health. His research focuses on health risks of inhaled pollutants, particles and ozone in outdoor air, and indoor pollutants, including secondhand smoke and radon. He's also investigated the occurrence of causes of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and respiratory disease. Uh, for several decades, he's been involved in global health, focusing on tobacco control, air pollution, and chronic disease prevention. He served on and chaired numerous committees of the U.S. National Research Council and Institutes of Medicine, chaired the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration's Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. He received the Surgeon General's Medallion in 1990 and 2006, the 2004 Prince Mahayadol Award for Global Health, awarded by the King of Thailand, and the 2016 Fries Prize, and he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And John, before you get up, I should have said, if there's a fire alarm, I should put this at the beginning, um, please follow the emergency exit signs to leave the lecture theatre, 
The assembly point is at the corner of Exhibition Road, which is, you go out of the, the building, you turn right, Exhibition Road's up there, and Imperial College Road, but we're not expecting a fire alarm. John, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, I didn't realize my bio included fire exiting instructions. So uh, this is a first of all. I, first of all, I, I'm honored to be here and to be asked to give this lecture. And it's nice to look out in the audience and see so many uh, familiar and friendly faces. Perhaps when we get to discussion, you won't be friendly, but um, it's nice to uh, be here with you. I was talking to Paul before I got up and uh, started uh, this, uh, before we got started, and then talking about giving a, a talk and um, sending in a title months in advance and then saying, what am I going to say? And what is this title um, about? So here we are, and um, I've had several days in a long airplane flight to continually um, tinker. So I'm going to play off. Jeffrey Rose a little bit and the figure that Paul showed you and talk about population um, risk. And eventually you see why I'm talking about a whale and a tail. The, I think that what we face in public health and much of what the uh, Centers and Health Protection Research Unit does at Imperial is to try and understand what the risks are that we face. And we want to know what those risks are because we want to make the judgment that Lawrence talks about in this, I think, eloquent book written quite a while ago. We want to know what risks are because we want to make a judgment as to whether they're acceptable. And our job in public health, science in general, is to try and understand what the risks are and to communicate what they are in the best way that we can. And then I think it's to all of us, and this is not simply in the domain of the science or academic or regulatory community for that matter, to make a judgment on acceptability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how we see risks may be um, quite, uh, quite different. And you know, I think mask wearing, for example, is a great example. Some wear masks. We certainly flew across the Atlantic wearing a mask, and then 95 respirator, actually, because our view of the risk is there is some, and why not protect ourselves? So we're all making these decisions, whether at the highest level or as individuals. So here is this figure and the book. I have a very multi-time read, falling apart copy of it, because it's, it's useful after decades still in its messaging and its, and its in a way, it's elegant simplicity. So I'm going to take this idea of these curves and say, what about the body of the distribution and the risk and the tail of the distribution? So, so those of you who, who uh, can't see it, there's the whale and the tail. And both are relevant to thinking about risk and what we want to do, both in our research and in our preventive strategies, however they may play out. So if you think about what drives the body, and that may be the distribution of whatever the exposure is, the cholesterol distribution, the exposure to air pollution, or whatever else it may be. And then we care a lot about the tail, because a lot of the unacceptable risk may live there. Rose wrote about sick populations and sick individuals. But aren't there some populations that are sicker than others, absolutely. And we're spending a lot of time now, perhaps belatedly, uh, working on that. So we are very interested in why you end up in the tail, along with the body of the distribution, which may drive sort of our burden of disease uh, estimates. And I, I think the other uh, simplification that lies here is, in fact, there are probably multiple curves with different shapes. And the shape of the curve is going to be important in how we think about risk. And sliding over some of these curves makes a difference. It's not the same as sliding over the nicely drawn normal curves that we saw in the uh, prior, uh, prior slide. So in terms of thinking about this, some populations must have different curves. And we spend a fair amount of time now thinking about 
population vulnerability, which means you have more exposures than others, or susceptibility, which means you have greater risk given exposure than others. So some curves are easier to move than others as well. So just some thoughts to think about as we sort of plow through um, what I'm going to say. I think um, the tail, as I've said belatedly, the tail of the distribution has now receiving a lot more attention than previously. And you know, we have many eloquent descriptions of health inequities globally in the UK, Michael Marmot, Martin McKee, others have said a lot about this for a long time. And similarly in the United States, recently the work of uh, uh, Deaton and Case has received a lot of attention and a lot of uh, publicity with their talk about deaths of despair. And for those of you who are tracking what's happening in the United States with mortality, it's really not pretty. And uh, fentanyl is taking an extraordinary toll among those who are less educated, among those who are least, less likely to be employed, across the heartland of the, uh, of the United States. And then environmental justice, a coin termed originally by Robert Bullard in the United States in relationship to where waste sites were located in Houston, and a concept now that is fully embraced by the current Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, and I know of interest here and everywhere else where there are environmental concerns. Now, part of the complication is that what drives whether we are healthy or well and when we get sick is very complicated. And this is a uh, figure from a paper written by Tom Glass and uh, Matt McAtee, a student at Hopkins while I was there, on this sort of mega diagram going from the global level down to the uh, molecular level. And you know, putting together these sort of thing that statisticians on, uh, will model, of course, in some way or another in multi-level models as we try and piece together what is really driving health. It's further complicated, watch this feed of PowerPoint, because things change over the life course. And now there's so much emphasis on so-called life course epidemiology. This slide's available for donation to the Colorado School of Public Health. Uh, so this is, this is complicated. And you know, we, in much of our work, we pick one level and one point to intervene and to do research. And that, that may not work out. So just to prove I didn't make this up, here I've applied this to tobacco and tobacco control. So at the global level, we have a handful now in our consolidated global tobacco industry, tobacco companies. The largest, China National Tobacco, uh, and then followed by, you know, of course, uh, Philip Morris International, BAT, and so on. Down to the molecular level, where we have some very interesting work on biomarkers, determinants of susceptibility, liability to nicotine uh, addiction, and so on. So this diagram and the ideas really do um, work. And of course, we think about what drives exposure, vulnerability, and what drives susceptibility down at the lower levels of the diagram. So if we're sort of following that Rose paradigm, how do, we, how do we change the distributions? How do we take this and think about where we can intervene? And of course, the diagram tells us it has to be at multiple levels. Can't just maybe at one and perhaps it filters down. In tobacco control, we have the framework convention on tobacco control, which actually nations who are, have ratified it agree to do certain things that in the end will come down to the individual level, but it starts at the top. So what are some of the things we can do? Well, across this, we want to change behaviors. And there are many places where behavioral interventions could make a difference. Okay, and I've just highlighted some. Uh, you can insert arrows wherever else you might want, but clearly we want to target individuals. We take actions at the local level very often. Uh, we try and get people to avoid, say, sugar-sweetened beverages <clears throat> by raising uh, taxes to influence uh, behavior and so on. Regulation, okay, and I've 
going to come back and spend a fair amount of time on sort of evidence-based actions and approaches. And regulation uh, certainly figures strongly. Having guidelines on what we should do, what we should eat, where blood pressure should be, what is the right level of blood pressure, uh, how do you achieve it. We have national guidelines and global guidelines. So there's uh, all of these different strategies. Figure in uh, litigation, lawyers. And you know, I'm coming from the US perspective on this, where lawyers play very prominently in the environmental world, sometimes pushing regulation, and then sometimes delaying regulatory actions. Because there's this push and pull inevitably. And, and again, um, in tobacco, I'll say that litigation proved to be very powerful. And one thing that came from the litigation, the case in the state of Minnesota that I was involved in, brought the tobacco to industry's documents out into the open, including those from uh, British American Tobacco, which were in the Guilford uh, Depository uh, until I think that went away about a decade ago. So I have now a question. Since I'm in England and I'm talking epidemiology, I have to talk about John Snow. And uh, let's see, this is a question that somebody should be able to uh, answer. So I, I think that um, you probably realize there are two John Snows up here, one more ancient than the other, I guess, although contemporary. I had this revelation that at the University of Southern California, we had a summer course for high school students, disease detectives. And so I'm giving a lecture, and I'm doing my epidemiology thing. And I say, well, has anybody ever heard of Jon Snow? And these kids looked at me deservedly, as though I was the stupidest person they had ever seen. And uh, I got wised up as to who Jon Snow was. And then, in fact, the New York Times did a whole thing about that time on sort of the epidemiology of Jon Snow and who was the most popular character in Game of Thrones. I think they had survey responses from over 200,000 people just on Jon Snow. Now, I guess in London, there's this other Jon Snow in the uh, Broad Street uh, pump that I'm supposed to um, think about. It's amazing. There's this circulating idea. This just is easy to find that Jon Snow, here he is, removing the handle from the Broad Street pump. So did Jon Snow remove the handle from the Broad Street pump? Paul says no. Anybody else firmly going to say no? Come on. Commit. No. OK. All right. Good, good, good. OK, so he didn't. But I, I have to say, this, this idea that he, the fake news idea here that he removed it, you know, it's kind of a different model of policymaking. I mean, it would be, so if Jon Snow says, yep, the Broad Street pump and the water's you know, conveying cholera, I'm going to go remove the handle from the pump. So you know, that would be like, you know, sugar-sweetened beverages are causing obesity and then going into the local stores and carting out the sugar-sweetened beverages, which would be a hard job. But um, that would be the analogy. So in, the, in this Jon Snow model, what did he do? He identified the cholera outbreak. He did his investigation, did his uh, ghost map, his uh, spot map, if you will. He inferred, before we knew about the cholera vibrio organism, that water was transmitting the disease, I think pretty remarkable in terms of shifting a paradigm away from miasma. And he recommended removal of the pump to the council. And it was removed. And he continued tracking. So in this simple idea, we identify problems in public health. We gather data. We analyze and interpret the evidence that comes from those data. And we translate from evidence to actions somehow. That could be recommending removal of the pump handle. And then we do surveillance to see what has happened and may keep iterating through this loop. So that's, that's fine. And I think that's great for teaching Epi 1. But does the real world work like that? And you have evidence. And yep, do something. And of course, that's, that's not the case. So what I'm going to do is talk about the real world. Now, we're going to spend the next couple of days looking at the research of the two health protection research units here. 
in this incredibly complex, unreadable diagram that we have been provided on how the HPRUs are going to advance public health and the world. And I, I show this. It's just fine that it's unreadable, because the idea is that you start at the top with research and have impact across society and down at the bottom. And there are lots of such diagrams. I mean, I could show you countless numbers of these diagrams. So fair enough. Um, so you're going to have to look at mine. Okay? And that's what we're going to be spending time on um, now. So I'm going to talk about evidence-based decision making and sort of how I think this works. And I'm, I'm talking about this because I spend a lot of time now in this space. And I think for those of you who have gotten there, this, you know this is what happens when you get old and um, people think you may have wisdom to impart and everybody else thinks you can't do research anymore. So um, here you are sitting around tables and conference rooms making uh, decisions about uh, guidelines. So part of this is you know, evidence, which I like to think of as what we know. Okay? And ignorance is the opposite. It's what we don't know. It's this wonderful book written by uh, Stuart Feierstein, who's a neuroscientist at Columbia, who teaches a class on ignorance to undergraduates. Okay? And, and I think this definitional problem of sorting out not evidence over here and ignorance over here is often actually challenging. And if you try and pile up things over here that say, yep, we know that, and no, we don't know that. And if you don't know something, then you probably do want to learn about it. So it becomes a focus for investigation, discovery, research. And then doubt is creating a lack of confidence. Okay? And we should give the tobacco industry credit for really pioneering how to create doubt about science. It's a long story. It goes back to 1953, traceable to a meeting at the Plaza Hotel in New York, where the lead councils, plus a few others, of the US tobacco companies came together and launched a strategy of creating doubt about the then unfolding scientific evidence. And it continued and continued, and I'm sure it does in some ways. But for those of us who were in the 80s and 90s and sort of involved in the tobacco wars over secondhand smoke, it was omnipresent in many, many ways. Uh, David Michaels, uh, his second book on doubt is, in a way, a discouraging read because there's the same strategies spread. Climate change, some of the same people involved in secondhand smoke moved on, probably well paid, to the climate change um, arena. And then now we're in this post-truth world, which is, I think, particularly troubling, and we can perhaps talk about that. So how does all this work around evidence-based decision making? So if the world were simple, we'd pile up evidence. And those of you who have sat around tables, perhaps with the US EPA or other agencies, talk about the weight of evidence. I've heard that phrase. And you know, it's, in, in my mind, I always said, gee, what's the scale for weighing the evidence? Okay, and balancing against that, of course, is uncertainty. And if this tips in the right direction, you might say, yeah, we know enough, and we can take action. So again, that's the simplistic model that doesn't work. And we have evidence and uncertainty sort of weighing against each other. And then all this other stuff that is the real world. And that's politics. It's economics. It's advocacy. It's who's pushing for whatever action we may be looking to take. And you know, again, where this balances out is never clear. Anybody coveting this slide, a donation to the Colorado School of Public <laughs> Health will uh, work. And then we have this really new problem of misinformation and disinformation and how that figures into this balancing. And I think, you know, I, I mean, I don't have to say too much about our ongoing experience with the COVID-19 pandemic to say that certainly misinformation and disinformation have been key in some forms of decision making and some venues of decision uh, 
decision making. I can now recommend three or four very thick books should you want to read about the prior administration in the United States. Um, you may not want to know the whole story in depth. Uh, so that's the real world. Now, here's an example that is really current. Electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS, you know, which comprise all these electronic cigarette devices, plus all the new heat knot burn devices. If you want to see them used, you can walk onto the campus and you will see, I assume mostly students, um, happily using uh, vaping um, devices. So here's a place where we really need evidence. We need to model and we need to think about it. So these products, the debate, the story is about harm reduction. Does having electronic cigarettes in the marketplace or these other devices benefit public health? And it's just an example of the uh, complexities. And this is a very much a US perspective because you're taking a somewhat different path on these in the UK. I think a much more evidence-informed one. But if, if these devices are there, if you can walk into any store, gas station, drug store, convenience store, and buy an electronic cigarette, who might benefit? Well, adults who smoke. Perhaps somebody who's 60 years old with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who now is inhaling a less toxic uh, aerosol. And that's the group that might benefit. And then who might be harmed? Well, those adults who are re-exposed to nicotine decide they like it and they just don't get that hit they want from their vaping device and turn to uh, back to cigarettes. The renormalization of nicotine, secondhand smoke exposure, and what about kids? OK, so now access in the US to these devices is ubiquitous. You may know the story of Juul, which about five years ago rose up with extraordinary speed. Use of Juul among our youth uh, delivers a lot of nicotine. And we had children who were secretly vaping. They were designed not to give off a cloud. So we have children who were able to secretly vape in class who are nicotine addicted at 12, 13, 14 years old. So, so kids may be harmed. And think about that 13 or 14 year old launched onto a lifelong trajectory of nicotine uh, addiction. So what research do we do? And how do we figure this out? And for those of you who are parents, think about the risk trade-off here. I'm going to accept the possibility that my child may become nicotine addicted for life so that the 60-year-old smoker with COPD can add 0.5 years of life expectancy. So this question of acceptability of risk and the complication of the risk trade-off here is really demanding, demanding of researchers. And so here we are in 2022. Does anybody know what's going to happen to someone who's 12 years old, 50 years from now, at 62? Not a clue, right? So how do we model that? So what data do we, what data do we generate? So this is just an example of the complexities, I think, of trying to make these public health decisions and recommendations, and then thinking about what evidence can help us make it. And again, your framework, if you're the 60-year-old person with COPD and you want to extend your life, good idea, and stop smoking but you can't quit nicotine, then this device through that lens may seem good. But for the parents of the 12-year-old who really can't make this decision, you would you want your child to be nicotine addicted? So the trade-off here is substantial. The need for science is tough. And we had this uh, episode of uh, acute lung disease from this. So how do we do this? I'm going to talk about ideas of burden estimation, and trying to understand population risk. Who's read this paper? 1953, great Majid. Anybody else? So shame on you. Um, so um, you've got to go read this paper. So this is by Mort Levin, who was in my former department at Hopkins, did one of the first case control studies on smoking and lung cancer, published in 19. 50, 
And he wrote this paper in 1953. Basically, he said, I think smoking causes lung cancer in men. And if something causes something else, there's two things I want to know. How much that risk is and how much of the disease is caused by whatever the factor is. And he invented what we would now call the population attributable risk statistic. And in fact, here's a sentence from his summary. You can see pointing to individual risk for smokers and population burden. And in fact, if you look at this, um, you can see that even back then, smoking accounted for the majority of lung cancer in men. As a sideline, uh, here's another quiz question. Sorry. Uh, who did first described the odds ratio? No? Heard of the odds ratio. You think odds invented the odds ratio? I don't think so. There was, there was no Dr. Odds. There's a Dr. <laughs> Oz, but no Dr. Odds. So um, Jerry Cornfield did. In, a, in another paper that was described to quantify the risks of smoking. Okay, so this is 1952, was uh, Jerry's paper. So another Hopkins person at the time. So, okay, sorry for the digressions in the quiz. So, um, but in terms of the formalism of risk assessment, a lot of this, at least in the US, came with reports from the National Academies. And this so called Red Book, which was published in 1983, had important notions that. To understand risk, what we wanted to do was to know if an agent posed a hazard, hazard identification, really a causal conclusion. What was the exposure distribution? How did risk vary with dose? And then when you put the whole story together, like those curves in the Rose paper, what was the distribution of risk, which comes from putting exposure together with what the risks are of those exposures. So we do a lot of this to understand what risks are. Over time, we've learned, I think, to do a little bit better, and again, a series of reports, need to characterize uncertainty, and then to get the question right from the start. What is the risk question of interest? And then what kind of work do we need to do, in part, to guide uh, decision making? And I think whether formally done or informally done, these principles, particularly back to the Red Book, remain really key in how we approach particularly environmental challenges. The global burden of disease is really a global risk assessment, isn't it? OK, so it's looking at multiple factors and multiple outcomes. Uh, and it is really applying these same, uh, same principles. And we'll come back to that. So a half hour in, we're up to my ideas. Um, and uh, in the next hour, no, it's just, uh, uh, we're up to uh, sort of my thought about this. So we do research, and a lot of us in the room are researchers. The HPRUs do uh, research. And we, we do that because that's going to feed into some process that's going to end with action, just like that complicated diagram uh, of how the HPRUs are going to save the UK. Um, so, we do research that generates evidence on whether there's a hazard, on dose response, on susceptibility, which is important with that tail of the curve, and on vulnerability, what drives people out there. Whether overtly or perhaps more subtly, we think about what the risks are to the population, the risks to individuals, and the risks to subgroups. And we, again, have tools to try and tease those out. And then we take action. And, and the, these actions can take multiple forms, as I, uh, as I said. So uh, what do we need? We, we need money to do research. For some of this, we need very applied research. And, and again, I think with the HPRUs, you fortunately have a vehicle to fund the research that you know will feed into this kind of uh, schema. Uh, the evidence process. And gathering evidence, I think, has become complicated by the arrival of systematic review and the complexities of causal uh, evaluation. And particularly in some sectors, if you have a bunch of RCTs on what happens with lowering blood pressure, the task of putting it all together 
is fairly easy, I think, compared to the far messier task, say, of addressing air pollution, which some of us were um, involved, uh, involved in. And then uh, the question of who will actually look at the risks in the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency, most regulations, most changes in rules come with sort of risk, some sort of risk impact analysis. So uh, this is embedded and done in different ways in different places. And then you move into the very messy world of taking action, okay, which uh, can be, as everyone knows um, who's been involved, the place where evidence may meet its match in, uh, in combating different uh, influences. So I'll turn to air pollution uh, as an example and just go through the story quickly to sort of highlight some of this. Um, we were wandering through a Monet exhibit in uh, Denver, and there was this quote uh, about uh, London. What I like most of all in London is the fog uh, from long ago. And of course, I don't need to tell you what the fogs were, uh, air pollution episodes. And this is the London fog of 1952, which had some number, huge number of excess deaths. I know people still argue about whether it's 10,000 or 20,000. It was a lot. And the other point here is there was only 47 data points on this plot. And for those of us who have done sort of more complex time series analysis, here you can do what I call eyeball time series analysis and see the link between mortality and particles, smoke, and sulfur dioxide without any trouble. Okay, so clear evidence of a hazard okay, for particles. And then over time, we've gone through a whole long sequence of research, much of it initiated in around 19, early 1950s because of the London fog of 52 and other uh, events. And so you know, just running through this early on, we did simple things, really questioning what are the adverse effects of air pollution? Does it cause hazards? And over time, the questions became a little more sophisticated. The Harvard Six Cities study was launched in about 1974 and later has figured in prominently into understanding particles and risk of dying. It was actually one of the first studies to sort of hang air pollution monitors on people and measure what we were actually exposed to. American Cancer Society study, which was launched for multiple purposes, in Los Angeles, the Children's Health Study embedded these, these studies, moved to a new level, some of them did with exposure assessment, and they began to describe exposure response relationships. Again, part of what is needed for the risk assessment. The time series studies, which again, their colleagues uh, in this room have done these, now these very large multi-site uh, studies, and now these large national studies taking administrative records and doing studies that span entire populations, which are things we can uh, do now. So the result is a pile of evidence. We're still grappling with lots of questions. And as you're going to see, we continue to produce a lot of papers. And then this question now of how low do the risks extend, which seems to be quite into our ambient levels. So here we are doing all this research. And this is just what happens if you do a crude search for articles on air pollution. A lot of them, right? And that's part of our problem in bringing all this together. If you do epidemiology, there we are up to heading for 2,000 a year. Okay, pretty, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of papers. And you know, along the way, there have been many landmarks that have been important for us. The Nora, Pennsylvania, 1948 publications there. Uh, all the work on the London fog, uh, starting work in the United States in the 50s and 60s. Actually, Ben Ferris came to the UK to learn the methods of respiratory epidemiology and brought them back to Harvard. Uh, Waller and Lother, who were at St. Bartholomew's, if I have that correct. And again, their work in London, uh, air pollution in a city street. Uh, people in London are still doing work in the city streets. Is Oxford still in the uh, favorite venue sites, Frank? It is, okay. 
Uh, I'm not going there then. OK, and uh, more. And then the time series wave, uh, the papers from the Six Cities study and others showing that mortality was reduced for the long run by particles, our work on time series, and more and more and more. So this is mounted up over time. And then we've tried to fit the evidence in the US and elsewhere into our regulatory mandate under the Clean Air Act. And again, we have a process for moving from science and evidence to what the standard may be. And that shows the flow. So in a way, that makes it easy. If I do a study, I know it might have, how it might figure in. But there are many of these things in my sequence where we don't know where uh, the research will figure in. Systematic review and meta-analysis, as I said, has become key. And here is a meta-analysis of US uh, studies on par particulate matter and mortality. So WHO air quality guidelines, again, evidence-driven, meta-analysis, part of it. Uh, some of us are survivors of the uh, recent guideline uh, revision where we learned that it was hard to systematically evaluate and review the uh, epidemiological evidence and adhere to the way the guidelines, the rigidity of what WHO wanted us to do. So the end was a revision to the WHO uh, guidelines. So that all worked. Now, this is Tedros, the head of WHO, declaring air pollution the new tobacco. So the question is, do these numbers make a difference? When we do these assessments, we do the global burden of disease, is it useful to say that air pollution is the new tobacco, that the numbers are so big? I think when this, we first started saying this, it was useful. And it sort of brought air pollution um, onto the map of uh, environmental hazards. And that came from, you know, oops, I'm going to skip, skip your pop quiz. But that came from this kind of thing, where air pollution sits up there in terms of the global burden of mortality and the global burden of uh, disease, very high. And here's how it apportions out. So that's at the global level. And then the question is, what happens if we say, at the local level, how important it is? And I, I will just mention, I'm going to skip, because my wife told me I had too many slides. And she was right <laughs> for, for once. She, she, she said that. OK. Uh, but an example, so we've been working in uh, Addis Ababa. And we put in the first, along with US Embassy, particulate PM 2.5 monitor. Here's some data showing that things are above WHO guidelines for PM 2.5, small particles. And here are estimates of premature mortality, attributable mortality, for monitors sighted at different uh, locations. So now we're going to learn, this is new, if having this local number makes a difference. OK, so these big global estimates are important, but those are the local ones make um, a difference. So in this air pollution story, there are many places where air quality is improved. This is our particulate matter levels in the United States. And if you look back, they have really dropped dramatically. We still find this signal of adverse effects persisting. But the levels are orders of magnitude in some places lower than they used to uh, be. Air pollution also ex exemplifies the inequity problem. And this complicated figure is looking at particulate matter exposure and generation by, for different racial ethnic groups in the United States, black, Hispanic, white, and other. So this is making the contribution to PM 2.5. And this is being exposed to it. And you can see much more for exposure versus making it through whatever people are using. So we have that problem. And we know on the micro scale, and this is a paper in Washington, DC, just showing the particulate matter attributable excess mortality and uh, asthma, which is, I think, this one right here, showing this inequitable distribution across DC. And this, of course, plays itself out in many, many uh, places. So this. This is back to the tail 
Um, so in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about problems with this paradigm that I've showed you. And you know, I've oversimplified the world. We, we have to for these diagrams, because otherwise they'd be hopelessly confusing with arrows and circles and feedback loops going uh, everywhere. So what are, what are some of the issues and challenges that we face? So how do we get the right funding to do what we need to do? And in the United States, this is often very frustrating because some of the applied work we need may be very difficult to get funded through our usual mechanisms, particularly our National Institutes of Health. We still argue a lot about whether something is or is not a hazard. The dose response data, particularly generating with epidemiology, are sometimes challenging. We're still learning how to do systematic evidence gathering. I probably shouldn't even say systematic review. The numbers may not have leverage. And then at the end, this sort of dissing of science that is um, going, uh, going on. So back to where research comes from, we may see a need for research, and the funding may not be there. One, uh, uh, one, one analysis, one sort of classification of research, this is from the Lancet series a while back, had this classification of research with relevance uh, to application, relevant to advancing knowledge. And I think I like this, this Dahl quadrant named after Richard Dahl, of course where you have work that is um, relevant to immediate application and, of course, advances knowledge. And I think getting research funded in that quadrant sometimes is challenging. One, one I think, ex example of creating a successful research agenda came from a committee that I chaired almost 25 years ago at the National Academies that followed our promulgation of our PM 2.5 standard. Dan Greenbaum, sitting here in the audience, was a member of that committee. And we set up a research agenda targeted at key uncertainties. And shockingly, our Environmental Protection Agency followed it. And again, we can, many of us elaborate research agendas. But we rarely are able to say, and this needs that much, and this needs that much and we can get the job done. So that, that is a problem. But here's an example of a success. This systematic review story and causal criteria is, I think, still going on. And particularly in the environmental world, toxicology, we're still learning, I think, how to gather and evaluate evidence. Uh, there are several groups working on so-called evidence-based toxicology. How do you pull together these studies? How do we pull together the work on mechanisms that many uh, do? So this is uh, on, uh, ongoing. And I would just say we're learning how to do this. I don't see that there's some alternative except to try and gather everything, because otherwise you don't know what the whole story uh, is. This is time consuming. And it's costly done uh, right. Now, causation. How do we decide if A causes B? Well, my famous cause meter does not exist, OK? And if it did, it would be probably not work workable anyway. Uh, but how do we do this? So we use these criteria, like those of Hill, OK, that probably many of you are familiar with, for evaluating evidence and determining whether something causes something else. Hill, 1965, I will note that the U.S. Surgeon General criteria were in 64, very, very similar, essentially, in what they do and say. And we still use these. And these are embedded in various uh, guidelines. The, um, this is a U.S. National Academy of Sciences report just out that essentially was done because a prior chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee questioned the methods that EPA used to establish causation. So a whole committee was uh, convened. And then there's this role of experts okay, that I don't think we understand very well. And I know many of you who sat around a table as an expert. Uh, come on, raise your hands. You're all guilty. And um, you know that feeling where you're trying to make these determinations. And we don't really know much about how well this works. Uh, a nice quote from George Comstock about 
drawing reasonable conclusions from imperfect data, which is something we all do. Moving along, lots of risk assessments are done. They may be very confusing. People can get to different places. Agencies can get to different places based on what they do. And again, in the US, many, many agencies do risk assessments. Many health impact assessments, quite analogous in principle, are done. The results may be confusing. Data may lead to different paths and different conclusions. Different models may leave different uh, impressions. So again, a part of the problem with the paradigm. And then at the very end, this very messy world of moving to action, where all those different factors come into play. The tobacco industry played this out extensively. It's as though they took my paradigm and said, what steps can we attack? This is a paper that I wrote with my colleague Tom Burke, where we sort of showed the systematic attack from saying everything is due to confounding and bias down to harassing researchers, you know, legal challenges to get access to data and uh, more. And in the end, the Department of Justice finding, of the litigation finding the tobacco industry of guilty of conspiracy to commit fraud, part of it, the attack on the uh, evidence. There may be times when we're worried that evidence just won't count. And this is a paper we published at the start of the Trump uh, administration. We'll find out soon if he's running for president. Has anybody gotten an alert on their phone? <laughs> uh, and, and again, you know, this is what we said. Scientific evidence does not change when the administration changes. But of course, the view of what is done with that evidence may change. And you know, again, we wrote this paper, and everybody said, that's a great paper. Our friends. I didn't hear from anybody in the Trump administration about this paper. Uh, or this. Uh, this is a um, hearing uh, at, uh, uh, in the House, before the House Science Committee, where the chairman is, says he won't believe anything that I say uh, the science director at EPA says, the science advisor, or someone, uh, another person high up at the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the government. So, so what do we do? Last few words. So uh, we can do better research, of course. We need to refine our methods for evaluation, synthesis, and integration of evidence. This causal determination, I, uh, you know, the statistical world and the epidemiological world is now caught up in causal modeling. There seems to be some confusion about what that is versus determining if A causes B. And I you know, think that people think that if you do the right model and estimate an effect with, um, in your favorite model that solves problems, it doesn't solve whether A causes B. It just gives you perhaps your least biased estimate of effect. Uh, we have to engage with these decision-making processes, communicate, and stand up for science. This communication piece is um, important. And uh, you know, again, I'm sure many of you have spent a lot of time in the COVID years talking about what the evidence shows and communicating uh, about it. People believe in science, still. Uh, it's very much polarized in the US by political uh, affiliation, but this is from recent polling about how much you trust science, which I was encouraged by. But then there's this whole problem that those of us who are scientists, expertise, evidence, it's doubted, OK? And uh, many have written about this, um, one of my favorite movies, one of my wife's least favorite movies, I think The Big Lebowski. You know, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. And that's sort of what happens. You know, you have your science, all that boring stuff, and I've got my opinion. And OK, I mean, that's fair. But that's really become a, a challenge to us now in, uh, in public health and making decisions. And acknowledging that the knowledge we generate is powerful in some contexts, and power brings in politics. And you know, clearly, this 
pandemic has just taught us that lesson over and over and um, over again. So just back to um, Rose and our figure. Um, I think you know we're all challenged to advance public health. And I think the, the job is complicated. Um, I think thinking these issues through about how we move from evidence to action is really important. I, you know, one of the, I think the regenerating thing about being in academics is there are always another cohort of students. And coming into public health, they all do want to save the world. And it needs saving. Uh, so I'm always encouraged that they are there. And then doing that job is really complex. And I think Rose's ideas are very helpful in sort of putting together how do we deal with the whale and its tail. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you again, Paul, so much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, that was fantastic, John. And John has very kindly agreed to take a few questions. Um, I must say I'm looking forward over the next two days to discuss the uh, knowledge graph <laughs> with you. <laughs> Clearly that's something of great interest. Uh, yeah. And there's a... Uh, can we get the, uh, the microphone down? We have a microphone. Thanks. Um, I saw you said that we need to stand up for science, but there's quite a lot of variation in, in standing up for science. Um, I don't believe that our government is listening to the science. So my interpretation of standing up for science was to go there and protest, and I was arrested for that. We can see that uh, protest is becoming more and more Ill, uh, illegalized. So what do you mean by stand up for sure. science? Sure. And so you stood up for science, obviously. And we, you know, and, and we had the March for Science at the start of the Trump administration. And we were in one of the... Um, one of the places where that happened, and perhaps others were, you know, I think there are actually many venues where you have to stand up for science. And whether it's communicating with the public, pushing the science foundation, and the many committees that many of us uh, are on, with our friends, I mean, I think the answer is everywhere. And I, you know, personally think that this is saying that, you know, could be with a family member. Uh, and saying, here's what we know and here's what we should be doing. Yes, you have your opinion. And I, I think you don't want to dispute the basis of anybody's opinion. I think that's a sort of a wrong track um, to, uh, to go. But I mean, the things you can do personally, I mean, I've written any number of opinion pieces that I try and reach the public, organize venues where we communicate the science uh, to, the, to the public. So I think there's a lot... You can do. I, I think if you go back to, you know, the the protest, the impact of that comes. You could tell me from the fact that it happened, and that people see this is important, and that there's you, you and others believe firmly enough that we have to stand up, to take um, to take action. So I, I mean, I, I I think that standing up for science is probably a bit different. You know, a long time ago. People protested the Vietnam War and stood up by the millions. And that did make a difference. Um, so I think you sort of look at everywhere you can go to, um, to advance the science. And I think this communication, and again, I'll, I'll take the example of the pandemic. Our group has not turned down a single media request since things started. I put together a series on what's going on with COVID for the public with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We did things weekly for a year. So I, you know, I, I think you have to look, um, look uh, everywhere. And, and I will say there are contexts where you might stand up. I'd have given you a long answer, but there's a lot to say. Um, I testified in some of the major tobacco litigation where I stood up for what we knew. There were people who were paid very well to say we didn't know anything. So, you know, just another, um, an, another example. So that conversation could be continued over a glass of wine. But, but it sounds like you did a good thing. So, so. so John, can I ask? So one of the things that's been a big issue here is, is getting balance. 
So if the scientists come on and say, you know, it might be on climate change, and then there has to be balance. So someone who, if you, in your words, has an opinion, comes and gets equal airtime to give the balance because they have to be balanced. How do you deal with that? So it's not balance, is it? No, it's not balance. And, but and it's, because but then you have the, 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 the scientist talking head who represents perhaps thousands of people and 10,000 publications, and then this person over here with their opinion. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, for one, I try not to enter into those things because I don't think it's the right way to do things, and I think it misleads the public. You know, back in the days of secondhand smoke, I would not do a public appearance with somebody from the tobacco industry who was going to debate me. Yeah. Because I thought there was no debate, and that potential debate opponent was not worthy in any case. Um, so I, I agree, but you know, if you take climate change where there's this ever more mass consensus about its existence and its attribution to man, and then the doubter over here, I don't think that's helpful as much as the media love it, or the shouting match, or the theatrical exchange. I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's good unless you are able to say, I mean, look, I, you've got your opinion, yeah. but. I agree with you, but you not turning up on those fora means they get someone else to turn up on those fora. And you, but I agree oh, with, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Frank, Frank had a question. John, I'm thinking about your analogy of the body of the wheel and the tail. And so if we have a situation where you've identified a hazard and you've identified you know, causation, and then if you think about the policy action required to improve things, you've got to go to the next step, which is the economics of the situation, the cost and benefit. Sure. Would that not favour action to support the body? more than the tail. Well, it might, but you know, you might be in the tail with unacceptable risk for you. And I'll, I'll give you a great example. So indoor radon, which of course causes lung cancer. And if you look at the distribution, it's sort of, uh, you know, poissonish with this long tail. And there are people out in that tail who have levels of exposure that are linked to high levels of risk of lung cancer in underground miners. So you wouldn't want to be in the tail. And you, if you're in the body, you have some risk. And if somebody says, well, do you want to spend, I'll use US money. Well, actually, dollars and pounds are now equivalent. So do you want to spend 2,000 pounds to put in a radon mitigation system in your home? And here's your level of lung cancer, which you, know, you don't smoke. It's not so big, but we can take it down even lower. That's a good thing to do, and you actually have to shift the population. The, and radon is a really good example because we, what we really want to do is shift the distribution of concentration in homes, not of actual exposure, because we all move, mostly move homes, and probably more in the US than here, perhaps. So we want to shift the distribution of what's in homes. So I agree, you know, Frank, that economics inevitably figure in. And when this whole strategy came up of, uh, measuring radon in every home in the US, a lot of the dispute was about economics. And weren't we going to have to mitigate the body of the whale? And we weren't going to get that much benefit to find, protect people in the tail. But the real argument is, that, that goes with the dose response. The dose response relationship for lung cancer and radon is linear down the zip. So there, you, know, you would say, well, we can, we can actually do something. And I, I think there's pretty high confidence in that dose response curve. OK. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, at the back. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, come to you. <laughs> I didn't think I was up next. Um, yeah. But OK, thank you. I was just think, going back to the original title about your last step about action. I sit there on a you know, government expert committee and we spend our time mapping out the evidence landscape. And I think we do this very well. And we pull in all these considerations and new research that's coming up. And then we just hand it to the policy makers as though we expect them to understand the complexity of this landscape that we've mapped out. 
Is there a role for us to take that next step, to actually look at the, two things, one, to look at the elements in that landscape and map it directly onto policy and say, because of this, it means this, and this policy needs to be changed or is at risk or should be developed, or, and should we also be working on solutions since we don't do much research on solutions at all? So if, if I asked you to answer your own question, would you say yes and yes? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. But you know a lot more than I am, and you're the worthy <laughs> speaker here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I think so. Look, I, I think many of us have been on those committees where you sit around for sometimes days, every now and then drink too much coffee and uh, get a report done, right? And, 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 you're not, and your point is, is well taken. Are you done? Or does something else come with that to sort of disseminate and get the word out and interact with policymakers? You know, I've, I've been on many US National Academies of Sciences committees. There are others in this room who have been on those committees. We do these reports, which are sometimes really good. We usually <coughs> learn a lot. And in my view, these organizations like the US National Academies don't do the job they should necessarily of disseminating and getting it out. Do I think there's a role for those who sat on these committees to disseminate the results? I think yes. And we may do that through activities, through things we write. But you know, I, I don't think that the, those who are taking action are likely to be reading you know, the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, sadly, uh, or whatever else. So you know, I, I, I fully. Um, Agree, I've done many of these things that have been extraordinarily time consuming. And then 10 years later, you go, gee, whatever happened to that report? I'll, I'll give you an example. I spent a year and a half of meeting just by Zoom, chairing a committee for the National Academies on providing respiratory protection for the general public and for the workers <clears throat> not covered by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Innumerable Zoom meetings. I think we wrote a really good report about how we should do something. We've had dissemination workshops with some federal entities. Do I think that Congress, which is one of the groups we called on to take action, somebody's going to read it and go, oh, we have to introduce the bill to do what John Salmon's committee said to do. Dream on. But maybe the staffers will read it and take some action. And of course, the alternative, the next thing is that 20 years from now, there may be something else that requires respiratory protection on a massive scale. And people go, oops, we dropped the ball, didn't we? Which may well be. So your point's well taken. I, I think the only other prob problem here is that many of us have day jobs. And these expert committees are sort of ancillary to our day jobs. And doing what you suggest, which is something I think you're right, I would say yes and yes too, is pretty hard to go and do. So you know that sort of takes away your, you know, your leisure hours. So, but uh, it's something I think we should do. So, 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 John, on that, Jeffrey Rose had the opposite view. He thought his job was to get the evidence, and to, to provide, and then hand it over. And there's a there's a bit of an issue of people who get the evidence and then come what's known as an advocate, because if they become an advocate, right. people then downgrade right. them as the right. scientists because right. they've got. That, so it's actually, and also Jeffrey believed he didn't have the skills. That wasn't his skill base. Someone else needs those skills. So it's it's. A well, this is a you know this is I, I mean this is a, an ongoing discussion, of course, isn't it? And uh, there's one prominent epidemiology journal whose original founding editor Ken Rothman said we don't like policy comments. And sometimes I will say that last paragraph of epidemiology articles is often something fairly naive and mm, yeah. not good. And I, I share this concern about of Jeffrey Rose about stepping into that world. But advocacy is different from being involved in assuring that what you've found is translated into action. And I think that, so to me, I, is the distinction. I, I think I like the idea that the National Academy's job, or here it's the Royal Society's job, yeah. is once they've got a report, then to disseminate and you know, inform yeah. the right people. Right. But I mean, certainly, you know, 
Um, I've been aware in, in other contexts of people who were very, very good scientists and then were considered advocates and then basically not believed. Right. And of course, I, I'm just turning this around one more time, Paul. Uh, you know, for example, the tobacco industry used the ta tactic of labeling researchers as advocates, thereby yeah. saying, you know, yeah. they're not doing impartial science, they're doing advocacy. And I, yeah. you know, I, I think for some colleagues, it was a fine line, admittedly. But uh, I mean, I, I agree, but an advocate in that situation is being used as a pejorative, which it shouldn't be used yeah. that yeah, way. So Manj had a question at the back, and then I think that's the last one. Otherwise, we'll be here all, all night because there's so that's much okay to talk too. about. <laughs> Hi, yeah. So it's, so it's on the same theme around action. And so, you know, some of those graphs from that basic science to policy, advocacy, and action, you know, largely means I have increasingly less control. There's, there's stuff I can do really well, and I understand how to design a study, make inferences, and, and, I, and I can do that. But... As I move down that chain, I, I basically I become dissipated and I, and I don't have the control anymore and I have to move into another sphere. And I suppose, you know, are we going to have this same conversation in 20, 30 and 40 years time because the paradigm of process doesn't change? That, that we automatically think that, hey, I do some science and I make a declaration about what I observe and then I hand it over and someone writes a piece of paper that says this is really good and we should implement this as a, as a broader strategy and we make an aspirational document, which is what a policy is, and there it lies in the, in the refetters. And, and I suppose, do we need to change that process and, and look at other strategies? For example, integrating with innovation, actually healthcare systems, do we just forget about policy and look at the data and say actually let's implement an intervention at a whole healthcare system setting and learn whether it makes sense or not to do that. And I, and I suppose it's just useful just to explore that the, the process we've outlined that we've been doing for decades, you know, to me feels partly broken, if, if not materially so. And I, and I wonder whether we just need to stop doing that or at least think of alternative ways right. to answer the problem. Right. So I, I think your point about loss of control is very well taken. And I talk about this, about stepping into sort of non-scientific settings where you have no control and you may have entered into some sort of processes you don't even understand. And I, you know, the, the analogy I've testified before our Congress multiple times and it, stepping into that arena is a good example because there I'm playing some sort of symbolic role. I'm the scientist who's supposed to say X for some reason in a process that may be partially invisible to me. So I think your point about loss of control is very well taken, but that, that said, when I talk to people about this, I say, you should do it, but you should do the best you can to understand why you are there and what your role may be and what you're supposed to communicate. I obviously totally oversimplified the world with these boxes and arrows. That said, I think it's useful, and there's clearly many different paradigms. The clinical world, to me, is different, and the idea of evidence-based medicine which has the proposition that antecedent to evidence-based medicine, we did non-evidence-based medicine, uh, which is an interesting thought, and how you do things empirically and show that they work or don't work. I mean, I think that's all really important, but I, I think your, part of your comment points to there are different spheres. And in some regulatory settings, and again, I'll speak in the US context, it's very clear that there are these boxes. And then in other processes, oh, I don't know, you know, the world Paul lives in salt reduction or something, it's not quite so simple. There are many things, but in the end, you, to, to take that action, it's individuals, it's manufacturers, it's, you know, going on, on, on down. So, I, you know, I think your point is well taken. And the, and the only other comment is if you think your world of action ends when you publish the paper, then you're protected from losing that control which you spoke to. And, and you know, it, it can be terrifying and there can be costs. I mean, there are people who don't like me and say mean things about me, uh, believe it or not, uh, because they don't like what I've said about science. And, and that, you know, and that, and that is, you know, that, that's, that's almost inevitable. So there may be somewhat of a price to pay depending on what you step into. 
John, we're going to end there, other than uh, our head of school, uh, Deb Rashby, uh, is going to offer a vote of thanks. Thank you, Paul. So, some, well, two-thirds of a lifetime ago in 1980, I started as a postgraduate at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And my very first lecture was from Geoffrey Rose, because the first morning was on introduction to epidemiology and he gave us that. And I remember to this day, the complex idea is this trade-off between taking an individual and a population perspective that he explained very clearly with reference to real examples, data, but completely motivated by wanting to make a difference to people's health. And those ideas have stayed with me. I've come back to them. I've explained to other people from time to time, or at least tried. And I think what we saw tonight started off from that same idea and has most of the same characteristics. You know, we've had complicated ideas, talked about clearly, different complicated world about the interaction between evidence and how you get that into policy and how they interact. And actually, the discussion has gone a great deal deeper than most of discussions that we have when we've only got a short while for discussion. And it's actually got me thinking about, the because of John's responses, yet again, what are the responsibilities of us as individual researchers? And do we then take that paper and talk to the media? Or what do we do as a school or as a community? Because I think a lot of what you were talking about is actually teamwork and indeed protest is as well. So very thought provoking. I think I'm going to come back to that and find myself rehearsing some of those ideas and stimulation when I'm talking to other people. Uh, John is over here, not just to give this lecture, but because he chairs the advisory board for Paul Centres, Paul and Frank Centres, for the next couple of days. So I want to thank you for that as well. Now, there's two traditions after these things, one of which is that I would normally present you with a token of our appreciation. <laughs> Thanks to the post, and I think some people having <laughs> put the wrong date down on a delivery thing, my understanding, we, we are very optimistic <laughs> that you will have it before you leave, but we need to pretend at the moment. Oh. <laughs> and then we can have a picture. <laughs> and then we can have a picture, cup. indeed. <laughs> have a cup. And then the other tradition that we can honour is that these conversations can carry on over drink, be that alcohol, non-alcohol, as you make your own individual decisions about your preferences and your risks. Everyone in the audience is invited to join us for that. So it remains for me just to ask you to join with me in thanking John for an absolutely superb lecture that honours Geoffrey Rose and his memory. <laughs> Thank you.